啊，你说两点到结束就结束，这意思是吧？然后讨论的这个部分是是这意思吧？嗯。Okay, let's start. Uh, can you help me? It's fine. And especially for the scholars and the students online, well, it's fine, right? So good afternoon. Uh, today we will talk about the issue. Or the to under the topic of the birth of the century, actually I published a book in the same title in Chinese. Of course, it's not in English. So here the piece, and to talk about the position of 20th century China in Chinese and the global history. So. I will talk about the four questions, but this time, because the limit, because of the limit of time, I will focus on the first three issues. If we have enough time, we can talk about it a little bit later. So the the one is how to define the 20th century in China, and the second is the imperialism and the theorization of 20th century. The third one is. The creation of the preceding history of 20th century and a contemporary, uh, contemporaneous correlation. So these are three questions. We will start with the, the first question: How to define the 20th century in China? Here now we are in the 21st century and uh, almost the second decade now, the end of the second almost. That uh, in the last From the late 20th century, we have different arguments about the 20th century. The first arguments or the slogans of farewell to the revolution were raised by Professor Li Zhehou, Liu Zaifu. It's our my former colleagues in the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Basically, partly because after the end of Cultural Revolution, and had a reflection. On the 20th century, the farewell to the revolution means that the revolution was already, already passed, and um, with a very nuanced and negative sense on that, uh, the, the the century. But some other, the philosophers in other countries, more radical, like uh, Professor Alain Badiou from France, he. Publish a book entitled "The Century." In the first page, he cited this one sentence here: "The century already existed." The Alain Badiou was the generation belonged to the generation of the 1960s, so there were anti-war campaign and a certain kind of the students' movements were all. That so he still had a good memory for that. He saw that the great legacy from the 20th century in uh, in the whole world. So he tried to preserve that legacy even for now and the future. So it's uh, different slogans and different the attitudes toward the 20th century. And in since the 1980s almost. A lot of the hi historians will argue that actually the 20th century was not that specific in our history, because basically we most because you know they argue that these are process determined by its internal historical development. So obviously, it's a lot of the continuity from the long history. That a lot of the historians argue that these sentences actually I cited from the professor Philip Kuhn from Harvard University. He passed away several years ago. The, so that if you read the historiography or historical studies, you found a lot of historians focus on the continuity or the interaction or the relationship between the traditional mm -hmm. China and the 20th century China. To see that the certain kind of continuation inside of that, obviously that's different from the early historical studies 
on the 20th century with the focus on the revolution, on the rupture from our past. So that's the, uh, the different views on that. And uh, so, up to now, the how to define the position of 20th century in the history of China is uh, still the big issue. And uh, if you read the, not, uh, the, not only the scholarship, but the mass media, the ones you talk about the event in the 20th century, immediately some emotional reaction to that the arguments in different ways. So that's, so in that sense, 20th century still living tradition in our own age, still, yeah. So here, the, when we talk about the 20th century, we need to rethink about the 19th century. What's the early stage? of the history. The idea of the 19th century in the world history is very important because basically 19th century is not something like uh, the early period. 19th century to some extent for many historians was thought as an episode of a certain kind of the period of so-called modernity or the modernization in human history. So here, I list some scholarship here, the Eric Hobsbawm trilogy, the long 19th century, the 1789 to the 1914. Obviously, it's longer than the one century because 18, uh, 1798 was the year of the French Revolution. That the end with the burst out of the World War One. So in that sense, long century. So American, or the French Revolution, American Revolution, British Industrial Revolution, especially for European history, the French Revolution and the British Revolution were most important revolutions up to now. Because a lot of people thought that the French Revolution provides the political model democracy, citizenship, and so on and so forth. And the British Revolution provided the economic model, market economy, industrialization, urbanization, and so on and so forth. We are still in the process of that kind of so-called from then, the modernization process. But that kind of the arguments criticized by some scholars, they will say that uh, those the narrative of the 19th century only focus on the European history, not outside. So that's why the Christopher Bailey, the birth of modern world, the periodization almost the same, and the Jürgen Osterheimer, the transformation of, world, of the world, a global history of 19th century. All these works, the periodization was the, almost the same from the late the uh, 18th century down to the early 20th century, the World War I. And so, but they try to integrate the other parts, the South Asia, the Southeast Asia, East Asia, or Arabic countries, Islamic world, into the narrative of the 19th century. So that's the basically, the, this is the typical periodization of the 19th century. The question is that, here, these are the two the covers of the books. But for them, and uh, especially for the more popular narrative of the 20th century, that uh, Eric Hobsbawm said that uh, it, it was a short century. Partly because why it was short? Because it started from the World War I and with the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it's much shorter than the one century compared to the long century. That's the first. Second, the, he actually the, defined the short 20th century as the age of the extremes. He's, he saw that the, because contrasted with the age of revolution, he, it's different because basically French Revolution, Industrial Revolution in Britain provide some new models. Revolution means that the productive. 
extremes that a lot of the the costs, a lot of the tragedies happened during a time, but not that productive. So they imply that the 20th century was filled with violence and didn't leave us much legacy like the French Revolution and the British Industrial Revolution. That was the basic arguments. The World War I, World War II, Cold War and so on so forth, and a different kind of the tortures and a different kind of the tyrannies and so on and so forth. So he defined the 20th century in that sense quite uh, negative to some, to some extent. And the 19th century is also the, uh, here we can talk about, here the review, I cited from review on the Osterheimer's book, that they say the 19th century, the Osterheimer insists, was above all a time when unprecedented amounts of knowledge were accumulated and displayed in archives, libraries, museums, exhibitions, and encyclopedias, when the world was measured and mapped with a new precision, when its inhabitants were counted and classified and depicted in novel ways, and when information could be globally transmitted more rapidly than ever. From Chinese perspective, we also can use this description about our own 20th century, right? Like a classroom. The, the Tsinghua University was established in 1911. And the Beijing University, Jing Shi Dai Tang, was also earlier, one decade earlier. So all belong to the 20th century, basically. So it's not 19th century, partly because these were also can use for that. But for Eric Hofbaum said that, that these were kind of repeat what 19th century achieved, already achieved. So we can argue from that. But the question here, I raise another question. Is there a 19th century, the 19th century in Chinese history? That's the, uh, the big issue because we had no such category of the century before the 20th century almost as a basic unit of time or the periodization at all. So in the beginning of the 20th century, there were still the competitions between or the among the chronologies here. I mentioned the first is that Kang Yu Wei is a very famous intellectual or literati. In the late 19th century, he was the major figure in the 1898 reform. We know that uh, he's a very important figure. And after, the, uh, after uh, 1898, the failure of the, uh, the reform, he escaped from China. Oh. He escaped from China, and, uh, but at that time, he tried to, and even before that, he tried to promote the Confucianism as our national religion, right? So he here, in the launch of issue of Qiang Xue Bao, in, in order to prepare the, the reform, that before the uh, 98 reform, uh, a newspaper promoting the reform, reformation in Shanghai. He actually referred to the contemporary Qing imperial reign of Guangxu by the chronology of Confucius. He said that, that now we are 2,373 years after the Confucius days. So the chronology was very different because we talk about the century is a Christian calendar, right? So we can talk about the Confucian idea. But interestingly enough, the starting year was not the birth year of Confucius, but the death year of Confucius. So here, this is the, the first. At that time, they tried to use the new chronology for China. It's uh, the second is a nationalism, the revolutionary nationalism. They want to throw down threw down the Qing dynasty, and uh, they are invented the chronology starting from the Huangdi, the Emperor Huangdi, the earliest ancestor or the ruler of Chinese nationality for, for them, the nation. And the legendary founding emperor, he said that uh, 
we should not the Confucianism, but uh, not Confucius, but the Huangdi as our ancestor. So basically, they talk about the uh, 3000 BC before. B BC, that's, that's the Huangdi's year. And uh, why the, here, the, the, the contrast between Confucius and the Huangdi means that the Confucianism could provide an ideology to unify the whole nation. Not only Manchu ethnicity or other ethnicities and Han were all under the reign of Confucianism. But the Huangdi at that time was deeply influenced by the Western or the European nationalism. They argued that the, the, the Han ethnicity as the core nation or the, the, the ethnicity of the Chinese nationalism. So they, they pay the tribute or the respect to Huangdi. So they different, different chronology explains the different political implications. You have the different political implications. So here in our country, we are all descendants of the Emperor Huangdi. People from different hometowns are actually one family. That's the later was also the, uh, the same. They, they try to combine these were the, together. Now we can see that the Yan Huang Zishun, Confucius were all treat as our ancestors. So this is a con contemporary situation. And of course, the, uh, these were the first, now we can see that the, who is the first of uh, the uh, people. Uh, who raised the issue, try to employ the, uh, try to use or the popularize that the Huangdi calendar. It was the Liu Shipei. Liu Shipei later, have you seen that the, 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 the soup opera or the, the TV series, the Jue Jing Nian Dai, Awakening Time? And the Liu Shipei at that time was thought as a conservative intellectual during the May Force period. He was on the opposite to the new youth magazine, the Chen Du Xiu and the so, so. But in the early 20th century, he was an absolutely radical activist, strong anarchist, and together with a nationalist. It was him to invent or the, suggest that we should use the Huangdi, uh, the calendar, was because he used that calendar for the uh, uh, refusal of the Qing, the legitimacy of Qing Dynasty. So it's, he, he fought for the revolution against the Manchu Empire. So the, nine, the year of 1905 was calculated in here and defined by Song Diaoren, another the prime minister in the Republic of China early, he was assassinated later, a pioneer and a leading member of Chinese United League as the 4,603 uh, years after the enthronement of Emperor Huangdi. And uh, since then, Ming Bao, the official journal of United League, started to use Emperor Huangdi's chronology too. <laughs> so they, they tried to use these different cleanliness and uh, technology. Of course, uh, some people will use the Christian the, uh, chronology. So when we talk about the 19th century, 20th century, the first four, we need to think about when the people try to use the category of the century to, to paradise our own history, to organize the narratives of history. So the alien idea of, of the century and uh, was closely linked to the Gregorian calendar. So the Gregorian calendar was established by the Italian uh, physician and, uh, and the philosopher Aloysius uh, Lewis as part of the reform of the Julian calendar. And in 1582, it was adopted by the Pope Gregorian. That, uh, that's, that's the, the, you see that the year was most important. Only in the late 19th century and the early 20th century did it truly become a universal calendar. So even in, only in the 19th century, Britain adopted this calendar. The first, first country who introduced that the Gregorian calendar in Asia was Japan. 
in Mingji time. I think it's in the uh, 1860s or the 70s, the first time they introduced this idea. However, they didn't use it as a universal calendar at all. Even now, they still use the emperor calendar and some other calendars too, together with that. So, in Europe, the 20th century was born in the atmosphere of the fin de siècle, although this French term encompasses sense of the new epochs coming arrival. It is much more of a assertion about the former epochs impending conclusion. 19th century, 18th century and their sequence as a derivative of the 20th century. Because before the history was organized and narrated in different timeline, at, we know that the Tang Song Yuan Ming Qing and the Suang Su Force only in the 20th century, we reconstruct the narrative of our long history. In that sense, the 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, even early centuries were the derivative of the 20th century narrative of history. So here, but, but it's interesting, you can compare the, uh, the Confucian calendar and the Huangdi calendar and the Christian calendar calendar, what's the, the similarities among those competitive calendars? The one issue what compared to the early calendars, we talk about Guang, the first year of Guangxi or the second year of Guangxi and so on and so forth. These calendars was basically based on the linear line of time. The time is from the beginning, developed to the end. More or less, the linear idea of time, it's, in, it's embedded in different calendars, though they were themselves were among the competitions. So it's a lot of the competitions here. So here, the most important thing, I think, once you employ the category of the century, to paradise your history means that you are now, it's, in, it's a certain kind of the birth of the global synchronicity in the history of China. Because in this time, you try to define China in the position of the global history. Not only the history from the early period down to the now, but the different dynasty, the different emperors and different but now you need to rethink about your relations to the other areas. You think about the uh, French Revolution, you think about the American Revolution, you think about the Russian Revolution, or you think about the other history and create the, the idea of the synchronicity. So the synchronicity is very important here for the 20th century. That the global synchronicity was very important. So here, uh, still, among the scholars, there were different arguments about the 20th century. He, I, I cited the two here, we already talked about the Hobsbawm's the age of the extreme. But here, the Giovanni Arrighi, he is an Italian-American historian. He is an Italian, but he's a professor. He was a professor at the Johns Hopkins University. And his books, at least two books, were trans already translated into Chinese. One entitled Long 20th Century, the Long 20th Century. Obviously, it's not the short century. It's a long 20th century. Why? He, he tried to observe the history from the global financial system and uh, the system of the state. So the off structure of the whole global system, he was belonged to the school of the global world system. He, his argument that because the whole world belong, it's a one world systems, but with the focus, some center of the world system is shifted. It's, it's always shifted. And of course, the French Revolution, British Revolution means that the, the center of the world system was in Europe. 
the Western Europe is, or the Northwestern Europe. And but but 19th century or the from late 19th century is part of the long 20th century. Basically, his arguments about the long 20th century started from 1870s. Means gradual shift that from the, the center of the global system shifted from Atlantic to the Pacific, from Europe to the North America. So in that sense, he tried to allow people now to talk about the American century. That means that the 20th century. But that was became really true only after the World War II or even the end of the Cold War, because still the Soviet Union and other was another world in the whole 20th century. But basically we need to know that the, the idea of the century is about the periodization and the t unit of time. However, historians treated these century well, in different ways according to their judgment analysis about, about the historical developments. So in that sense, the concept of 20th century is not only a concept of periodization. It is also the process of historical actors grasping their trend of times in Chinese way. The shi shi. We know that the now the, the time changing. We need a new term to define our time. So to develop our strategy or decide our action. So in that sense, this is a very important. And the, the age of the, the concept or the category of, of the century actually became popular was only in the 19th century when the European to talk about the end of the 19th century, they talk about fin the cycle. So if you read these, uh, the literature or the arts or the psychology and so on and so forth, the most popular expression was a decadence, asceticism, and the pessimism, and the theory of degradation. Before that, we had the early 19th, 19th century, we talk about evolution, theory of evolution. But now it's for the theory of degradation. So it's a thought that the sense of collapse of civilization by the end of, or around the end of the 19th century, from 1880s to 1920s, I think that period were a lot of discussions about the decadence or decline of the, uh, the civilization theory in the West. But on the other hand, you have the, the end of the century, but on the other hand, there was a so-called geopolitical panic. It's like in the political science, international relations, following the developments of the colonialism and especially into the new era of imperialism, so much discussions on the geopolitics. A lot of the classics of geopolitics produced in this era. So even the term geopolitics was from there. So basically imperialists tried to occupy the whole globe. So that's the, the period of the, the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century. So in this sense, the notion of the century is closely connected with the 20th century. So on the one hand is a temporal demarcation. They should use that the, the periodization. But on the other hand, it's a started, it's an understanding of the singular propensity of the time, or the trends of the time, which render the history of others into a history of one's own, while situating it within the history in to forward explanation and identification. What's the meaning of that? As I said that the, when you employ the term of century to define your time, means that the emergence of synchronicity in the global scale. So in that sense, others' history became part of your own history. We are living in the same time framework now. So here, the most important thing was the series of the revolutions happened. 
we know that from 19th century to the 20th century, a lot of the imperialist wars from Opium War, French, Sino-French War, and the Sino-Japanese War, and so on and so forth. The war was not new, continued from 19th century to the 20th century. But what was the new for the beginning of 20th century, which marked the be new beginning of the new era for that time? It was a series of the revolutions happened. The first, I think, is Russian Revolution of 1905, which was triggered by the Russian defeat in the Russian-Japanese War in 1904. That war was happened in the northeast of China, Lu Shengkou. You know that if you read Lu Xun and other sh the, the, the intellectuals memoir or the stories, a lot of description on the psychological impact on them that war happened in China and but it was something nothing to do with us is a colonial time in, the, in that time but immediately that the revolution also had the, a lot of the serious impact on other issues in the whole era Iranian constitutional revolution of the 1905 to 1907 and the Turkish Revolution 1908 to 1909 and the Chinese Revolution of 1911. But you know that the revolutionary organ, the Tongmenghui, the organization was established immediately in after the, it's, it's in, after the war of the uh, Russian-Japanese war is in 1905. Mingbao, we mentioned the, the uh, uh, periodical, the magazine, by as the, the Revolutionary Journal was also published the same year. So that was, so in that sense, from to 1905 to 1911 was a period of the 1911 revolution. That was, I think, one of the most significant events in the beginning of the 20th century. Then you have the, the Russian Revolution in 1917 again. Of course, that the, the October Revolution was a reaction to the European war. But on the other hand, if you observe that the long developments inside of Russia was also can be thought as a part of the chain of the revolutions, what we call the Asian revolutions too. So then you have the main force movement and the first revolutionary civil war and so on and so forth. All these revolutions what happened in the peripheral rather than in the center of the capitalist global system. So that was different from 19th century revolution. That revolution happened in the central area of the global capitalism. But these, these revolutions were all happened in the marginal or the peripheral areas of the global systems. So that was, I think, the change the whole global situation that the marked the beginning of the century. It's not only, I think, that, so that's why it's not single event marked the beginning of the 20th century, but a series of the events marked the beginning of the 20th century. That was, uh, of course, full of the turmoils, wars, and a different kind of the revolutions up to the, maybe the cultural revolutions. So that's why we can define that century was a century of revolution. So you have two ways to define the 20th century. One is started from the new era of American century or something else, the, the basically the prehistoric condition of the imperialism or so on and so forth. But on the other hand, you can define it from more active sides, so dynamic sides to define it. I think that the, what's the major difference between the 20th century and the 19th century, that was the series of the revolutions happened in the, in the peripheral areas. So that's why I think the, uh, the, the beginning of the 20th century was from these he, here. So now we talk about the precondition, the, the imperialism and the theorization of the 20th century. So, According to my check on the documents, maybe when the first significant 
employment of the term of the century was by Liang Qichao in his long poem, the 二十世纪太平洋歌 in in Chinese is the song of 20th century Pacific Ocean. That was in the January 30th of 1900 in Honolulu. So after the the failure of the 1898 reform, he escaped from China, exiled in Japan. Later, at the invitation of Sun Sun Zhongshan Sun Wen, he was he planned to visit America. But when he arrived in Hawaii, he was stopped by his teacher. We mentioned earlier the Kang Youwei, because Kang Youwei disliked to see his student work with the revolutionaries. He still tried to be more or less the reformers and even tried to restore the Qing Dynasty for the more progressive Qing Dynasty for him. So, but Liang Qichao after that. He arrived in Hawaii. He still wanted to go there. The, in the deep night, that day, he thought that uh, the, in the in, in the in the coast of the uh, the Pacific, he feel a lot of things happened in the global history. So he wrote a long poem, which entitled "The Song of the 20th Century Pacific Ocean." That was also very important because in in 1898 to 1899, in that period, the Hawaii was fully integrated into America. So that was after the uh, the, the the American Spanish War. So the the Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, and some other places became the you know, either the colony of America or the part of America. And so that's the other one. And also there was a certain kind of rebelling at Hawaii. That's why the, he felt the new age already began for Liang, uh, Liang, Liang, Liang Qichao. He, Liang Qichao almost was the most famous intellectual in the first decade of the 20th century in China. So he's interesting in that long poem. He tried to do the periodization of the whole history. So he divided the history into the three stage. The first stage was the age of rivers. For him, the early civilization China, India, Egypt, the Asia Minor, the age of chaos. This is the age of chaos. You remember that in Chinese, age of chaos means Ju Luan Shi. So it's a Confucian periodization of the whole history. The first stage was the age of chaos. The, 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 the second is a little bit moderation. It's a kind of the peace, but still a lot, a lot of the problems. So the second age was, is the age of continental sea, the Mediterranean Sea, Baltic Sea, and Arabic Sea, and the Yellow Sea, as well as Bohai, an age of certain kind of Shenping Shi, the certain kind of the peace, but still at the a lot of turmoil wars. So he for him that the second stage, that were traditional. He obviously he tried to combine the Western idea, the Western periodization of global history, into the Confucianistic idea of the developments of different stages. In, the, the, in these poems. But according to the Confucian idea, especially promote, promoted by his teacher, Kang Youwei, his last stage should be the age of the harmony or the great unity, Da Tong, right? It's a, it's a Taiping Shi, it's a Taiping, it's a great peace. It's no wars, no conflicts, and so on and so forth. However, he didn't use the term. Taiping Shi, because he feel now by the end of the 19th century, the human history enter into the new era, which full of even more dangerous, full of the dangerous threats and the clashes and the possible atrocities. So that's why he didn't name it, and the age of Great Ocean after Columbus. 
the time of colonial imperialism, the age of great unity. He directly employed the term imperialism, but used the so-called national imperialism in order to try to compare to the uh, different difference between the traditional uh, uh, in empire and in the modern imperialism. So that's why he talked about this. But he didn't use the great harmony or the Taiping, partly because in that sense means that the traditional narrative of history here was bankrupt. You cannot use, continue to use that, the progressive stage to describe the, the whole situation of the global history and the Chinese history too. So that's why he began to use the term of the new term, the 20th century. That's the almost the most significant employment of the century or the 20th century. In that sense, the concept of the century was closely related to the 20th century. So here, and also he tried to combine the concept of time, the century, together with a new concept of the space, means the Pacific. So it was the age of the 20th century Pacific time. So if, if you read the title of the poems, immediately you can see these are the, uh, the, the combinations and the full of the implications. And uh, next year, he managed to arrive in America. And uh, he tried to observe what happened in America. He tried to study there. He was really intelligent and uh, had the sharp observation. He published a long essay entitled The Monster or Giant Genius of the 20th Century. Trust. Trust is a certain kind of the form of organization of the production. As now we have a lot of trust actually, it's, but that was the new form of organization, organization of the trust. We know that in Germany there was a Carter and in America the trust, the, the large scale, uh, the production form. But he used the term of, in Chinese as a jiling, or the ghost, or the giant genius, or the monster. Anyway, these are very strange things for him. It's a really new. He said that the rise of trust was meant to redeem the evil of surplus production. The trusts became increasingly intricate in organization and increasingly appropriate in management, which increased the amount of prop property in the U.S. by the several times. The American trust was the consequence of excess productivity or overproduction. We talk about the overproduction. Later we will explain that the, in the 20th century a lot of theorists try to analyze the crisis of so-called imperialism mm -hmm based on the accumulation and overproduction. So he already started from observe these phenomena, not only for the military perspective, but trying to understand it from the economic perspective. That, so that's the, uh, the, the and American imperialism, the consequence of the excessive capital since the establishment of charts, both in effective as remedies. So here is a talk about the monopoly of the organization, the, the new organization in the production. So that's his arguments for that. So he basically he tried to understand what's the nature of our age, what's the major threat and the difficulties for us so that we are in front of this new, not only the invasion, military invasion, but something different in the production, transformed the whole society. That's the strength of America, but it's also the dangers for that. 
it's for the rest of the world for him. That's the, the idea to talk about the monster of the 20th century trust. And it's not only him, but several others will talk about this the, uh, the issue. Here, this is Kai Zhi Lu, it's a wisdom guide, it was also published in Japan by those overseas students to talk about these kind of the issues. For example, they said that the, today's so-called imperialism is a greatly different from Napoleonic imperialism. The imperialism practiced in North America is in fact territorial expansionism and invasionism and so on and so forth. So here, these are the, 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 the issue. The term of imperialism became the topic from that time. The Liang Qichao already in his uh, Song of the 20th Century Pacific is talk, touch upon or the use the term of the imperial or the national uh, 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 imperialism. Maybe this is the first book on the imperialism trying to theorize, analyze the new phenomena. It was a Kotoko Shusi. Is a Kotoko Shusi is the pioneer figure, revolutionary and a reformer in Mingji Japan at that time. So he was committed, you know, he was uh, si killed actually by, by the, emp uh, the emperor at that time, the, the Japanese, for his revolutionary activities. It's interesting, you see that he talked about the monster of the 20th century imperialism. For him, the, the, the imperialism is a monster of 20th century. The Liang Qichao talk about the, the monster of the 20th century as a trust, which also showed that the Liang Qichao tried to observe these phenomena from economic perspective. However, the, the, for the Kotoku Shusi, he said that the, because Japan was less developed, not in, industrial enough, compared to America or Germany or Britain was still the backward in, in that sense. However, already became an imperialist country, partly because it's a nationalism. He talked about the nationalism. He tried to understand it from the more or less subjective perspective. Not only the, he talked about the economic and military, but mainly focused on the mentality, the certain kind of it. So you can see these are the, the, all these most important theorization of the time. Liang Qichao's Song of 20th Century Pacific Ocean, Kotoku Shusi's the book, the, the monster of the 20th century imperialism, and 1902, the J. Hobson, the, the, this book was thought as the classics of the, the, uh, the theory of imperialism, published in 1902. Before that, we thought it was the first book. But in East Asia, we already found some other books or the articles to talk about the same issue. And later, Paul Lavag. Paul Lavag was Karl Marx's son-in-law. Actually, in the same year when the Liang Qichao published The Monster of the 20th Century, The Trust, he also published a long essay, the small pamphlets on the trust. So these are all. The later, the Rudolf Hiverdin, he the finance capital, that was the classics for the financial capitalism. So that's the, uh, the, the later we know that the Lusa Lusenberg, uh, uh, the Kosky and the Lenin's book was classics in, uh, in, 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 in these regards. What I list here, they different, developed a different perspective. For example, the, the underconsumption and the overproduction for Losa Losenberg, for the, the Hobson, and for the, com uh, the, the financial systems, the financial capitalism, the Hiverding and the Lenin were all different. So if you read the Liang Qichao, he already touched upon different aspects. Not as systematic as those theorists, but he touched upon almost all, most of the major issues. So that's the, uh, the whole period, the people to talk about this. And which shows that what I talk about, the so-called synchronicity. We are living in the same world, face the same challenges in different regions, not only for China. 
So here, that the, uh, there was a lot of the wars and the revolutions. If you look at it, it's uh, uh, the full of the wars and the revolutions in that period. So if you think about the early legacy of the 20th century, is the people try to rethink about what happened to the world and what happened to the China and what's the challenges we are facing. So that's the, uh, the, the basic uh, situation in China. So in that sense, the concept of the century conveys the epistemology of that feeds, feeds the diverse species and their historical lineages into a universal vision of synchronicity in which the relationship between China and the West, between the ancient and the contemporary, cannot be described with binary categories such as the West represented by science and technology and China by culture, nor can it be regulated with European versions of universalism. Here is a paradoxical phenomenon because we are living in the same age, the way that in, a, in the concept of time and the space, we are in the so-called synchronicity. But on the other hand, in the whole 20th century, we developed these binaries, West vis-a-vis -vis China and the East and vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the West and so on and so forth. So here, but, but the substance of it is not completely different. We talk about the different positions in the whole system. When we talk, it's really interconnected. So in that sense, the notion of the century symbolizes the birth of a universalist conception of history and the contemplations on the internal imbalance of this universalist history and the subsequent contradictions and the conflicts. These are different positions and the imbalance or the unevenness of the universalist history. Not simply we are completely different by nature, but we are now intertwined, interconnected, but in different position within the same goal and in the time of synchronicity. So that's the, uh, so at that time they talk about the revolution for the independence as a form against imperialism that started from the beginning of the 20th century developed into the, 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 the 70s, for example, the national liberation movements still in different regions happened here. So here, these are from Kai Zhi Lu, we cited from the beginning. They say that now Asia and Africa have just undergone the incidents in Philippines and in the Transvaal. Future conflicts between the independence and the imperialism would be a, the way more intense than the revolutions in European countries. Here, it's interesting, in the beginning of 20th century, he tried to understand the situation of Asia together with Transvaal. Do you know the Transvaal? Where is the Transvaal? It was in South Africa that the, in the Boer War, there was a war in the, in, in the, by the end of the 19th century, it was a Boer War. The Britain had the uh, conflicts with the local small two, the, the Republic, that a huge, the, the, the global impact in the different regions. So the, the first, without the connection in time and space, it's difficult for the Chinese intellectuals to define these events far away from China to, to, as a reference to think about our future or the fate, the conditions of that. So these are the, 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 the connection. Without that, the, the timeline of so-called synchronicity, it's difficult to understand these connections or interconnections. So here I will talk about the, uh, the, the part three, the creation of the preceding history of the 20th century and the contemporaneous correlations, correlations. The preceding history of 20th century China came into being as it absorbs the external into the internal. 
This new political thinking had a certain anti-historical quality, means that uh, we, a lot of people in the 20th century believe that uh, it's, we are now living in a completely different new age. So the breaking through the conventional borders of historical narrative and including the narratives of others in political thinking. The term in Chinese in the 60s, 40s, we always talk about the Shi Wu Qian Li, no early examples of, of in the history. But of course, now the historian already try to find the connections or the continuities from the early period down to now. Still, we talk about like Confucianism and cultural traditions and so on and so forth. But the 20th century, the breaking through the conventional, the, the border of historical narrative was somehow is a condition for the new political thinking. So that's the other, uh, I give you the examples. And also that gives you the possibility to rethink about our way of thinking. In the beginning of 20th century, a lot of the discussions in different camp, political camps, reformers, conservatives, or the revolution rad radicals, they all they talk when they talk about China, actually they made the reference to Japan, to Germany, to America, to Britain, to France, to, to Transvaal, to South Africa, and some other uh, India too. Before that, if you read any kind of the documents in China, uh, they will talk about the so-called the Golden Age, three generations, Sun uh, Dai Zhi Zhi. It's uh, the, the you, you talk about the ancestors, or you talk about the great empress to imply what we should do, but now the people talk about the Russian Revolution. They debate about the nature and about the Russian Revolution. Some were critical, negative, but some were positive and embraced. And then they talk about the French Revolution, Turkish Revolution, German question, American question, and so on and so forth. Not mentioned Japan was most references, a lot of the reference to the Minji Japan. So they try to learn from the reform and the revolutions from others. And they argue about this history almost like that we argue about ourselves, the future. So that was if you compare to before the 19th century, even in the mid 19th century, like uh, Gong Zizhen and some others, they always talk about. But the ba major political treaties focus on our own history. But now it's everything. Almost now, if you debate with some other your colleagues or the classmates about the Chinese future or the issues, you will make the reference for some people. Like my generation, will talk about. The, 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 the French Revolution or the French Enlightenment or the Scottish Enlightenment and so on and so forth. So it, in that way, they integrate the, the all other's history into our own history. So for the historical thinking, the political thinking, the way of political thinking transformed following a new timeline framework and in the new space, the idea of the new space, it's, it's really different. So the different types of nationalism, globalism, it's emerged against these kind of the global analysis in different regions. So here, the, the characteristics of the intellectual debates about China and the West, the past and the present, as I said, they develop the binaries between the past and the present, uh, between the East and the West that discursively often resort to the essential, essentialist cultural differences. Even now, we still, a lot of people talk about that China was so different. It's uh, because we are, by nature, it's different from some, some, some people else. But substantially, they're aiming to descend the position of China in the new global relations, namely the positions on the axis of time and of new time and a new space. So in that sense, without the, 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 like the, the concept or the category of the century or the new consciousness of synchronicity, it's difficult 
to understand such a transformation. For example, it's difficult to understand Manfort's new cultural movement. The Manfort's new cultural movement that talks so much about so-called French civilization or some others. Why that kind of the issue triggered the huge debates? Partly because that new relations emerged in, in the 20th century China. So because of this, I just briefly to think about this. Remember that at the beginning when we talk about the, uh, the, the birth of the century, actually the certain kind of the idea of the linear time already the emerged. It's really captured by the linear idea of time. So the reorganization of na narration of history. But that progressive or the evolutionary history was reduced the complicity and the multiplicity of cultures and the different traditions. So that's why on the one hand the new narration emerged but on the other hand a lot of the intellectuals dissatisfied with that framework try to launch or to start to have the reflection on the whole framework. So it's not only, only for it but also for the reflection on these. Here I, you know, these are the Yan Fu, who was the, the first president of, of Peking University at that time, Jing Shu Da Xue Tang, he was famous for his translation. He studied in Britain and uh, studied the naval technology, but eventually became a famous translator. He translated Adam Smith, Montesquieu, and a different kind of the, uh, the John Stuart Mill, and uh, a lot of the classics of 19th century Europe. That's very important. And however, most famous one was Tian Yan Lun. It was a translation of Thomas Huxley's Evolution in Essex and the Edward Junk's The History of Politics. These two small books were even more popular than his translation of other classics, the big one. The, so he's a very famous, but the, the Thomas Huxley's evolution introduced the idea of evolution. That was the founding stone, I think, for the new consciousness of history in the 20th century, because a linear time was came from the idea of evolution. But that obviously simply reduced the complexity of history too. So that's why like uh, Zhang Taiyan, he, uh, he was another very thoughtful, provocative thinker. He was maybe his student, even more famous, Lu Xun. Everybody knows that he was Lu Xun's student, uh, the, the teacher. He published articles to criticize sharply about the theory of evolution. He did, not everything was on, on evolution. So he tried to do that. He published these kind of the articles. Basically, he, he said that the, he tried to delineate the difference between China's patriarchal society and a type of patriarchal society in Jiangs, the history of uh, the politics. Questions the omission of historical diversity and structural alternatives of the social formation narrative. Develops a conception of the singular trajectory of historical transformations in China. So that was very important because those people were so, so called the figures of modern, Chinese modernity. But on the other hand, they, they also reflect, uh, reflect the trend of thought for the reflection on the modernity itself. So that's in, in, in the field of the knowledge and the historical narrative, they also developed these kind of the ideas. So these are the, the one of the, the, the issues. I will not talk to so much for that. And how to understand the, the, these kind of the history, East and West and so on and so forth. Here I also, the Patha Chatterjee was an Indian scholar. He, how to understand the nature of the nationalism. He said that the, the most powerful as well as the most creative results of the nationalist imagination in Asia and in Af Africa 
are posited not on the identity but rather on difference with the modular form of the national society propagated by the modern West. How can we ignore this without the reducing the experience of the anti-colonial nationalism to a character of itself? means that though the nationalist movement in China at that time or in Asia were try to imitate a lot from the West, but basically you still to understand the difference here, given the conditions, historical conditions. So that's the, the idea. And also the, uh, the 20th century arguments about our language is another issue. May Force movement was a monocular movement. We changed the way of communication. Especially, this is the, the issue. But that, where well, all these kind of the issues happened and became the topic of the debates. So some people promote the spelling system for Chinese, right? It's, they, they simply, the, some radicals like Liu Shifei and those people, they even the anarch, especially those anarchists living in, in the France at that time. Wu Zhihui, have you seen that from that, uh, the TV series, uh, Chen Qiaodian, Chen Yanian, all those people, deeply influenced by the idea of anarchism, they even promote the Esperanto to replace the Chinese. The, they thought that we are for this, but the radical revolution in the linguistics. So in that sense, the 20th century revolution was not only about the wars and some other socio-economic relations, but also the cultural relations. But obviously, there was a counter-argument for this. And uh, the Zhang Taiyan and those people were strongly against this, because he said writing is science for language, language balance of thought. Though languages are natural, but it's not because they existed in the universe from the beginning. The origins of the language is by the effort of man. Hence, the language roughly conforms to human happenings if there were disturbances in the human events. So well language and the writings be <coughs> disturbed. So preserve the, our own culture is also the, somehow the mission of the 20th century, too. So in that sense, it cannot be simply say this is a conservative up to now. So these are what the also they give our lot of the cultural legacy here, even in the age of the revolutions. So we can think about these. Uh, uh, he talked about these are another sides. He uh, Lu Xun was a radical one. However, he even said the superstition may remain because uh, some imagination, some ideas came from there too. So these are the, I have no time to finish all the, the, uh, the, the discussions about the century. I only talk about the beginning of the 20th century. Then we should ask the question, when the 20th century end? Whether or not it's already ended or still ongoing. So we are living in the 21st century. If the Giovanni Arrighi said that this is an American century, a lot of people thought that. Too. But still, America was dominant in the world. How can we understand the whole global system? And uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union together with the Eastern Bloc was marked the, 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 the end of the Cold War and end of the Eastern Bloc system, but a certain kind of the transformation in China took it different ways. So how can we judge the continuity and the, the ruptures in here? So remain a big question for us. Thank you. <coughs>